Hey Hip Hughes, I love your videos on history, but the video to which I'm now replying is your recent upload titled Why I Oppose Ed Reform. I'm starting about 25 seconds in, just getting the preliminary music and whatnot out of the way. So, uh, take it away and let's chat. You can vehemently disagree with me down in the comments below. Now I'll do a video response instead. I wrote a letter the other day. I'd like to start off reading that letter. Dear Data, We've been friends for a long time, which makes this a hard letter to write. In the past, you've been close to me, and you've given me really good advice about teaching, and for that I will always appreciate you. But in the last few years, things have changed. You've changed. It seems like you're trying to control me in the classroom, direct every decision that I make, and worst of all, it seems like all you ever want to do is evaluate me. Ha ha, Mr. Hughes, Data's not a real person. But the Ed Reform Movement and its emphasis on data. The reason really that I'm making this video is I had Chinese food today. I did, I had Chinese food. And I got this, uh, this, this fortune. And the fortune says, statistics are no substitute for judgment. Statistics are no substitute for judgment. And at the core of my profession is the art of teaching. So I want to tell you the three ways that the current Ed Reform system, I think, is hurting uh, all of us. Just so everyone's clear here, I don't go around uh, <laughs> gathering my little pearls of wisdom about how the world operates by what I find in a fortune cookie, particularly given that that's something that uh, Asian people give only to Americans. If, you, if you're from their culture and you go there and you order their food, what they're going to give you is not a fortune cookie, but fruit. Just FYI. <laughs> oh, and statistics aren't a replacement for judgment. They are something to inform judgment screwing your kids. Um, I really do see, I, I, I was hoping that I was just becoming cranky old men, and that it wasn't me. But I think that if I, if I pull myself back and I look at the situation and I'm honest with myself, I do see a difference in the kids and how they think from 15 years ago to today. I see less innovation, I see less divergent thinking, I see more blank stares. Kids want to be told what to do. When I, I... Well, I'm just going to point out, at all, at all levels of academia, I'm presuming that you're talking about primary and secondary schools, not so much universities. That's a different animal. We work very hard, uh, we, I don't, uh, teachers work very hard to build a consensus and to impose uh, particular ways of thinking. And a whole host of reasons. We, if a child is too energetic, that has to be poo-pooed by uh, the powers that be. If you are too much of an individual, that is uh, that makes you uh, a good target for scorn, not simply by your fellow students, but by the authority figures uh, who you have no option but to obey on the pain of some kind of uh, punishment. That is, you're not going to change that by having a curriculum reform. That has to do a lot with uh, factors that, some of which are beyond the teacher's control. If you work in a large school district, you're going to be given a whole bunch of students. And if you have 35 students in there, you simply can't afford uh, to let everybody be their own special little unique individual who you're going to help grow and to be that, uh, that, um, that special little snowflake. The efficiency of the classroom is going to take some precedence over the individuality of the students, which is unfortunate. I, that's why, uh, well, anyway. Video projects, and in the past when I would do a video project, kids would brainstorm and, you know, I'd push them and nudge them, but it was like a fluidity of the classroom. It was really kind of cool. It was like organized chaos. But recently, you know, in the last couple of years when I've been doing them, the first thing kids want to do is they go, what do I do? What do you want me to do? Make a movie. Okay, what's step one? What do you want me to do? And I'm having a hard time kind of forcing them out of that kind of pattern that they're learning in their other classes, which are all very linear, very objective written, lots of rigor, lots of like structure, lots of grammar and analyzing sentences. And I'm just going to point out, I've been talking to adults for mm, several decades now, uh, many of whom are public school victims, as I call them, or public school graduates, as when in polite society calls them. And I'm going to dispute that they are learning a lot of grammar and logic and uh, linear thinking and a sentence analysis, given, given the, the absolute horrendous way in which so much of the American uh, citizenry writes and speaks, their revulsion at, the, at a person who is capable of showing that they are able to score moderately okay 
on, for instance, the SAT uh, vocab section, the verbal section. It, there is an anti-intellectualism that is pervasive in the public school systems. The teachers are largely to blame for this. They're not interested in whether or not you learn. They're interested in whether or not you answer questions correctly on some standardized form, some standardized exam, not realizing that if a person understands the subject matter sufficiently well, they are going to do well on the tests. And by that I mean to say, barring dyslexia or some kind of a diff eyesight part, you know, something where, you, where you, the, the questions you get asked are confusing to you. The person, so you have two things that work there. The person could understand the material that's being asked, but not understand, not be able to actually interpret the question that's being asked. And by the way, uh, a lot of the questions that, that get asked, when I say a lot, um, a non-trivial number of the questions that get asked are absolutely moronic questions. They'll ask something, uh, one, of the, one of my particular pet peeves is a question that'll ask, please select the best answer of the following. And you'll have something with A, B, C, and D. And uh, it'll be A, and then uh, A says something, and uh, all on its own, A is true. And then you'll have B, which will say something. All on its own, uh, B will be true. Then you'll have C, which is clearly false. And then you'll have D, that is uh, a combination of both A and B. Now, the correct answer there would be either A, B, or D. But if you're doing a standardized test, the only appropriate answer you can give is D. Because apparently, if you have one statement that's true and you add that to another statement that's true, you have a statement that's even more true than either of the, <laughs> the statements that make it up. And this is just simply false. There's not a better answer to that question. The correct answer is the one that is true. And you have three true answers, but they'll only accept the one. And this, does, this is not uh, logical. Assuming that they're not going to put in there, well, actually, I'm not going to get into like exclusive ors and exclusive nors, because that's not what's being taught in primary and secondary schools anyway. So to recap, to recapitulate uh, for the people who are paying attention, if you have three answers, any one of which satisfies the question that's being asked, there's not one that's better than the other. Uh, to the extent that you want to say that one is a better answer than the other is a good answer, is to the extent that you are evaluating on some aesthetic basis which one you prefer. But that's no kind of uh, objective measure of what is a proper response to the question posed to the student. These questions are tremendously annoying. So too are a lot of uh, questions that they don't give you enough information. They, they assume that you know things that are not actually a subject in the curriculum you're being taught. I was uh, working with my brother actually. Uh, he was doing some kind of uh, math studying. And one of the questions was about uh, various interest rates and the amount that one would pay in, in getting a loan for a car. I don't know why he was taking this class, but whatever. And in order to answer the question, you had to know the laws of a particular state where the test was being graded such that you could determine what are the tags and title fees that you pay to the state and all of the taxes that you pay in addition to the loan. I didn't know that. My brother didn't know that. It was nowhere listed in the curriculum. It's just something that they, they uh, that the test assumes that you know. Well, that might be a perfectly reasonable assumption if you live in Virginia versus, I don't know, California. It's a perfectly unreasonable assumption if the person to whom you're giving the, the test grew up in California and has just moved to Virginia. And I'm going to resist that even a little bit more. I don't think it's a reasonable question at all if it's not part of the curriculum. Who walks around knowing the, the current fee schedules of the state licensing commit, uh, agency with respect to tabs, titles, registrations? All? No one knows that shit. No one. But there's a question that, that if you get wrong, deducts a point from, the final, from your grade that you're going to get out of that class. It's going to go on your permanent transcript and follow you here and there. Absolutely moronic. But this test was written by people who know best. They sat down, they looked at it, they evaluated the questions, and they said at the end of the day, out of all, all the whole lot of potential questions, the whole lot of potential exams to give, that little debate committee sat down and said, this is the one, this exam, this is the one that, this is the best. 
This is the best that we can do. Publish it, send it out, it's now standardized. Haka Malika. Complete crap. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Elements of the comic core are probably good, but the way that it's being implemented is uh, really doing a disservice to your kids. Um, schools weren't built to make kids college and career ready. That occurs during schooling, but it's the other way around. I'm, I'm sorry, what? We make people college and career ready to, in order to send them to school? I don't know what you mean by the other way around. <laughs> I'm just confused there. It's the other way around. It's that schools create life. <laughs> that we go to school to find ourselves, that's what we're supposed to be there for. A lot of people go to university to do that, but we certainly don't send people to primary and secondary schools to find themselves and to discover um, what it is that their, their great calling in life is going to be and figure out who they are as a person. We send them there for, well, in uh, my particular case, a classical education, which is the one I think that uh, people should try to model, and that is to say the, uh, the trivium and the quadrivium, you know, um, grammar, logic, and then rhetoric. And that's the trivium, and then the quadrivium, which is a uh, geometry, music, astronomy, and arithmetic. Give them those core subjects. Make them, uh, well, I don't want to say pristinely aware, but at least competent with with those core subjects. And then you can, in doing that, you haven't taught them what it is they need to be thinking. You've given them the tools to be able to think. So they can take these, um, these pieces of information, this system of reasoning, and they can translate that to new types of subjects, for instance, whatever it is that, that uh, you're having them make these movies on. They will have the, the analytic framework by which they can evaluate new information, look at the structure, look at the logic, and then make something out of that system and use it in a productive way. But that's not what we teach people in the public schools. It's all about checking off boxes on someone's ledger. To fulfill our life's mission, to learn how to think critically and make decisions based on your identity and, uh, and, and academic knowledge, it's supposed to be kind of a place of experimentation, I believe, and it's becoming really a scientific um, procedure. And I don't think that's good for you. I don't particularly care for your slight against the scientific procedure. A scientific procedure is just one way by which one is... Uh, a, a, a approaches making decisions in the most rigorous way that we can. It's where we recognize that uh, we have cognitive deficiencies that are going to prevent us from objectively evaluating whatever it is we need to do. And so we devise a system whereby our personal judgment is not what's going to be driving the conclusions that will be reached by this dispassionate, objective, analytic process, this algorithm. There is nothing whatever wrong with teaching people to do that. It lets them draw conclusions which, while may be discomforting, are nevertheless true. And whatever else you want to say about education, it should be about giving people the tools by which they can evaluate information and come to true or plausibly true uh, conclusions. Which, back to the statistics thing. Statistics don't, they don't replace judgment, but they do inform judgment. Kids, even if they get into a top-notch university, at the end of the day, we want kids to be happy, and part of that is fulfilling the expectations that's supposed to occur. Learning is supposed to be natural. It's not supposed to come in a Pearson catalog. Number two, it's... What, what was it uh, Bertrand Russell said? Most men would rather die than think, and most of them do. Learning is not a natural... Um, let me, let me divide this this way. It is natural for the species, but not necessarily any particular member of the species. And by natural for the species, I simply mean to say that we have the, uh, the cognitive ability to learn if we apply ourselves. But it's not natural in the sense that people generally try to resist uh, learning too much. Learning the profession of teaching um, again, I thought, maybe I'm just getting tired of the job. Maybe it's just me, but everybody I talk to, not everybody, but the majority of teachers I talk to, they, they're opposed to this. They're burnt out. Our days are spent analyzing charts and datas and numbers and trying to justify why we make this... Datas. Hopefully those are the lieutenant commanders from Star Trek. Look, I'm not against, like, evaluations and, I guess, accountability. I think I'm pretty good at my job. But if I'm going to build a bridge... 
Don't make me spend my whole career, you know, evaluating the bridge that I built. You go look at the stupid bridge. I got other stuff to do. But now we're writing SLOs and we have to have data on every kid and show growth and it's our job to, to provide evidence and artifacts and ah I had stuff to do. I got papers to grade. I got lessons and kids and minds to grow. So what are you doing, man? It's really destroying the profession. Um, I teach at the I do is destroying the profession. Teachers are. And in a minute you're going to cite to a model that does not do you the service that you think that it does. Graduate level, and I see teachers coming in and they're telling me that they're now being prepared for what seems like a rote profession, that um, there's going to be scripts and like uh, steps to follow, and it's a profession. Remember our uh, dead poet society? Remember that scene? In my class, you will learn to think for yourself again. You will learn to savor words and language. No matter what anybody tells you, words and ideas can change the world. That's why I became a teacher. Yeah, and that's, uh, words and ideas can change the world. There's a reason that in the trivium, the rhetoric comes last. First, the grammar, then the logic. So, you, you, get, you get the vocabulary, and then you learn the rules by which you can arrange it in a uh, systematic structure, and then you get the persuasive bit. That's the part where the world gets changed. But, you can't go to the... R one does not fly into flying. One first walks, and then one runs, and then one flies. I... I'm totally bastardizing something that Nietzsche said there. You, you can't just jump into the ideas and whatnot change the world. You have to lay that foundation. And it has to be somewhat rigorous. I don't want to be the guy that doesn't rip the book apart. I don't want to be the guy that measures poems. I want to be the guy that inspires poems. So I'm really worried about the profession. Undisciplined inspiration is absolutely useless. If you don't have the skill set to be able to take whatever it is that's inspiring you, that inspiration is a motivation to do a thing. That one is inspired to do a thing does not remotely suggest that one has the, the, the skill set necessary to do the thing that one is being inspired to do. The job of the schools is to give people, at least at the, the primary level and the secondary level, the tools so that when they when they do find out what it is they want to do when they do discover what it is that inspires them they're actually able to go out and do that at least at some uh, rudimentary level and then if you want a more advanced level that takes more of an education uh, not necessarily formal education by the way but the, the person will have to study it in some sense but you first need to give them the the foundations upon which they can procure that knowledge and separate the wheat from the chaff and then make something useful out of it in service of whatever it is they're inspired to go do. We're going to do this right. We need to recruit great people to be teachers. We need to... And part of that is getting rid of the, the uh, teachers' unions that so uh, vociferously oppose having standards imposed upon teachers that require them to be competent. The, uh, I don't know what movie it's from, but the, the call is coming from inside the profession. Your greatest problem is the, the teachers that you have. You have a lot of incompetent teachers who want to continue paying their mortgage, who want to continue eating, who want to continue having a job that gives them money to do the, whatever it is they want to go do on that salary. But they don't want to have their competence measured. Pay them deservingly, and then we need to allow them to do their job like we do every other profession. Accountability, that's not my job. My Imagine any other profession that, that you could think of where you go up there and you see someone just totally fucking it up. Whether it's the, the guy who draws the paint, the, the lines on the side of the road, uh, cuts out the, the stop signs and paints them the right colors and puts the letter on it, or an obstetrician, a gynecologist, uh, a pediatrician, a police officer, anything you would like. And you see them just totally hosing it. I mean, they are just rogering the shit out of that. And you go, hey, 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 what's up with that shit? And you go, well, I, pfft, I'm not accountable. That's not my job. Call someone else who cares. That's one of the problems that taxpayers have with government officials right now, is everyone has the mentality that it's not my fault, I fucked it up. Accountability belongs to someone else. Please go find that someone else and complain to them. It's not my job to care if I'm doing it right or wrong. I'm here eight hours a day. I get paid by the month, no matter how little I work, or no matter how poorly I perform. Right now in Washington State, 
I think it's Washington State, don't quote me on that. There are two teachers who were fucking in a classroom, and we can't fire them because the unions here are so goddamn strong. They were on a three or four year long administrative paid leave during the investigation. And after arbitration, they get to keep their jobs for fucking in a classroom. This is off the chain incompetence. Accountability? No. Accountability does not simply belong to other people. It is the responsibility of every person who's on my dime to be accountable for their own actions. Period. Oh, but one thing that can get, get rid of you in school. Don't uh, point your finger at someone and go, bang. That's, that's a type of weapon. job is teaching, and right now the accountability getting in the way of the teaching. So get off my back, man. It's destroying the United States of America. Schools are supposed to unite us as a country. They're supposed to kind of create a fabric of uh, commonality between us. Well, they're supposed to educate you so that way you can uh, know certain things and by the time you reach the age of majority, you're not a, a driveling retard. Now, in the service of that particular goal, you are going to have separations that necessarily occur unless what you want to do is make sure that everyone who's possessed of some intellectual agency at all is retarded by the incompetence of their otherwise uh, people who are otherwise their contemporaries that it, it's not in some senses it builds a sense of community or commonality or whatnot namely in that all of you went to the same place and you have some common experience but it is actually to separate people out so those who's, who uh, have capacity will do better and go further than those who don't. It's not an indictment on those who don't happen to have some particular uh, je ne sais quoi for some field. It's not their fault. Nevertheless, the fact that uh, one person can, can do calculus and another person uh, struggles with fractions does not mean that because the one person struggles with fractions, what you do is you handicap the guy who can do the calculus. You say, okay, guy who can do the calculus, we're going to put you in this one class uh, where you learn more about math because you seem to have some aptitude for it. And uh, you who struggles with the fractions, we're going to put you in this class to help you get along. Both of you will, will work hard, hopefully, to reach your individual potential. Not to differentiate us, not to divide us. And I certainly can leave room for innovation and self-control over schools. I believe in all of that stuff. But right now, I think that we're in danger. We're in danger because our republic and the democracy of this nation and our school system is being handed over to the guy with the biggest checkbook. There, I said it. Don't be fools, folks. There's money that's being made here. There are organizations that are making money, and that's about as political that I'll get. So what do we do about it? We got some folks. We could fire a lot of teachers. So what do we do about it? Well, number one, we have to fire Arne Duncan. We have to get rid of the Secretary of Education. Well, I like that you're on a firing streak, but uh, you know, uh, maybe that's a good start, but that's so not where I would end. We have to contact our congressmen and politicians who have no business that are directing these decisions and get the money out of the system. Get the politicians out of the system. Wait, wait, wait. Earlier you said you want these people to be paid well, and now you're saying get the politicians and their money out of the system. You have inconsistent propositions here. That money has to come from somewhere. Unless you propose that uh, all the schools become private schools, which would be an improvement. The reason, one of the reasons that private... Never mind, I'm not going to get into that. Let's turn the teaching profession back to the teachers whose power it should be to direct so. And then if we're going to have accountability, let's do it in a more natural, authentic way. Having this number game nonsense, it's like a huge pyramid scheme, man. It's built to fail. So let's just rip it down and let's figure another way out to do it. Look at the system in Finland. In Finland, they pay their teachers really well. They let them do their jobs. And the results are pretty fantastic. Yeah, and uh, mo if, you, if we adopted the Finn system right now, you would fire the majority of public school teachers in the United States. Their entry-level requirement to teach the first grade is to have a graduate degree in the subject they're going to teach, uh, focusing on that, on that subject. They have to spend, in addition to getting their graduate degree, a full half of a year, a little over half of a year, uh, studying that particular iteration of it with respect to who they're going to be teaching. If you go up to the high school, what we call the high school level, it's even more stringent. You have to spend uh, two full years in your primary subject. I'm sorry, 
not two full years, you have to spend one, more than one full year studying just your primary subject, and in addition to that, you have to be competent to teach an entirely other subject on top of having your graduate degree. That's the entry-level requirement. Let's impose that on Americans, te on Americans teachers. Let's make them all have a, at least master's degrees and just to teach kindergarten and first grade that they have spent six, more than six full months of their life studying that one particular thing they're going to be teaching on top of everything else. Let's do that. But you can't do that for the same reason that uh, two teachers can fuck in a classroom in a school during the middle of the day and you can't fire them for it. Alrighty, I'm going to end it there and uh, I'll see what you have to say in response to this. Have a great day, sir.